Um, workshop we're going to be doing today is going to be kind of a really basic beginner's introductory um, modeling course. So a uh, step back from some of the more intermediate stuff we did in the last couple of weeks where we were doing a, uh, like a game ready model from beginning to end, um, including like UV unwrapping and texturing and all that kind of stuff. Um, we're going to go kind of really back to basics and just like introduce the fundamental tools um, that you use in Blender all the time. Um, if you're looking at the archive and you missed um, our very first in-person class, um, I do have the slides up for that. Um, there will be a link down in the description. Um, and the first class we did covered all of like the user interface, where the tools are laid out, like if you've never seen Blender before, what's where. Um, so I'd, I'd catch up on that first and then jump ahead. Um, jump into this one to sort of catch up with the rest of us. So um, what we're going to be doing today is going to be modeling something really basic. We're going to have a pencil, just a basic pencil in Blender, 100% um, in Blender. We're not going to be doing any you know, external texturing or anything, just Blender. So to, to start off with, what we want to do is add a reference image to our scene so we actually have something that we can use to then model our pencil like based off of. So we can either go down here to the bottom and do add image, reference, or background, or the shortcut for adding um, objects into your scene is Shift A. So Shift A, a as an apple, um, and it will pop up the same exact contextual menu as the menu down here, but it will do it anywhere your cursor is hovering, which is really nice and convenient. So I'm going to go ahead and add image, and I'm going to add a uh, background image. So the two options there were reference image or background image, and the difference between the two of those is simply that a background image is transparent and it's set um, by default to always be on top. Um, so you can model and you can always see that reference image on top of your, your 3D models all the time, whereas a uh, reference image instead is kind of, it's opaque and it's not set to layer itself always on top of the 3D models, so it will intersect with your 3D models, um, which can be useful in some circumstances if you're like maybe modeling a car body and you want to see the... Um, as, you, as you're pushing and pulling on like the hood or the roof or something, you want to see if you're dipping in and out of the... Um, the reference image. Um, personally, I prefer background images where it's always on top and a little bit transparent so I can kind of always see the reference I'm working on and not worrying about like intersecting and, and covering up um, the reference of, of what I'm trying to actually see I'm working on. So I'll add it to the scene uh, and you can see that up in our scene collections we now have an empty that's unnamed. I'll go ahead, double click this and rename this to pencil underscore ref. Um, and in some cases, I might even do like brackets, ref, pencil, or something, just so that if I'm searching through a giant scene with a lot of things, um, if I want to isolate out just my empties, I'll do brackets and just have EMP at the front of every single empty that I have in my scene. Or if I just want to do bones, or if I just want to do um, uh, reference images. And you can do some um, filtering of objects by type um, within within the the context menu here, but um, being able to, like, like naming conventions that help you, even if you um, have multiple images in your scene and some of them are references for one thing, some of them are references for another, having naming conventions set up so that you have things organized and you can always go back and find things later. Super, super useful to get in the habit of doing it. Um, so I have this pencil, this empty of the pencil in the scene. I'm going to go ahead and select it and just grab it and move it up a little bit just so it's sitting on the line in our 3D grid. Um, about there looks pretty much perfect. That's pretty good. Um, and you can see I accidentally clicked and this little um, this little target shape thing, I accidentally clicked and moved it. So the if I go ahead, I'm going to go to the eyeball and just hide the um, empty for a second. So if I start rotating around in the scene, you'll see that we have our grid where we've got X and Y here. And then if I go to one of the front orthographic views, you can see we have X and Z. From the side, we have Y and Z. Um, the grid here uh, is always showing us um, our units. And we always start from 0, 0 in our world space. However, this little cursor here, um, while it starts off at our origin, isn't always at the origin. Um, and the origin is 0, 0, 0 in our world space. So you can see if I go to my view here, the 3D cursor, 
which is this little target, can be moved around. When we add an object to the scene, so if I shift A and add like a, um, a UV sphere here, and I'll go ahead and change its radius so it's really obvious, the sphere doesn't start at the world origin, which is over here, it starts at the 3D cursor. So if I move it and create another sphere, it's over here. Um, so the cursor can be really useful for doing things like um, we can tell our uh, transforms to always be based on the cursor. So we can rotate an object around the origin or around some arbitrary point um, by setting the cursor and placing it in a specific place or add new objects in a specific place um, and even change the rotation of the 3D cursor. We can make sure that when we click on the surface of, a, of an object, the cursor is oriented so that it is perpendicular to a face. So we can then um, place objects in our scene perpendicular to the face of another object, um, which is really useful. But um, it is also really easy to accidentally misclick and move our, our cursor around the scene to places that we didn't want it to, um, accidentally rotate it to angles that we didn't want it to. So what we can do, um, we could either do is go over here to the side of our 3D viewport to the view panel where we see 3D cursor and right click in the, uh, in the transforms for the location rotation and hit reset all to default values, reset all to default values, and that will move our cursor back to the origin and reset its rotation or if we were to move it again, the uh, shortcut for that is Shift and C as in cat. And that will automatically snap our cursor back to the world origin um, without us having to manually go in here. Um, now you will notice that doing Shift C, it doesn't immediately, like that bit of the interface doesn't immediately seem to update all the time. Sometimes it can look like um, the cursor is actually somewhere else, but if you just move your mouse in there, it will like force that bit of the interface to update. Um, a little bit of a bug in Blender sometimes. Um, bits of the interface that you haven't clicked on won't update. Um, it's I'm sure it's an optimization thing so that the, all parts of the screen aren't being updated constantly all the time. Um, but yeah, so Shift C that will reset your cursor to the origin. Um, and so we're going to start by adding our objects at the origin. Um, so that we. Uh, so that 3D model is sitting at zero, zero in the world space, and that's like where we're always starting our objects from. So it's not like some, it's not placed arbitrarily at some random point in our scene. It's always starting from the center, um, which is which is like the the best, um, most useful uh, habit habitual convention to get into is making sure that your objects are properly centered, that their origins are set at like their center of mass. So. Um, something you will also notice um, as we rotate round, if we are in an orthographic view, um, so if I tap um, on my numpad 1, 3, 7 to jump between front, side, and top, we do see our background image, our reference plane here. Um, but if I were to just rotate and it jumps into perspective view, we lose that. Um, we can fix this, so if we have our, our reference image here selected and go down to our object properties, we can tell it to display in orthographic and also display in perspective view. Um, the reason that you might not want it in perspective view is um, if it gets really um, distracting, you're trying to do um, modeling on the side of the object and you're trying to do complex contour stuff, and the, the fact that this reference image is taken almost like from a... Um, as if it was from an orthographic camera. Obviously, um, all cameras have some perspective, some lens distortion to them, but a photo like this is designed to be used from an orthographic perspective. Um, so you get distortions. Um, you're looking at it from this angle, and we don't actually, from this angle, we'd expect to see the bottom of the, the pencil eraser and like the uh, the tip of the pencil like tapering off in, into the horizon. But obviously, because the photo was only taken from one angle, we don't get that kind of shift in perspective. So sometimes people like to disable seeing their um, reference images in the perspective view to get rid of that um, kind of discontinuity, which can mess with their brain. Um, but personally, I like to be able to see my reference images at all times. Um, and I like to be able to see them not just from the back or from the front, but from both from the front and the back. So let's go not just front, not just back, but both, and then we can see it from both sides. Super useful. So to start off with, what we're going to do is we're going to add um, a circle into our scene and then reduce the number of points on it down to be our uh, hexagonal cross-section of a pencil. So 
I'm going to do Shift A, add a mesh, and I'm going to add a circle. And the circle, by default, has 32 vertices or 30, 30, 32 um, vertices on the points in between edges. So it's 32 vertices, 32 edges um, between these. So I'm going to reduce this down. If we want it to be a triangle, we could do three. A diamond or a square is four, obviously. Five is a five, six. We're going to jump up to six, have a hexagon, and then that's going to become the cross-section of our pencil because most pencils are hexagonal. So jumping from our front view, I'm going to go into our edit mode. So tab, jump over to edit mode, and then I'm going to rotate this to be in line with our reference image. So if I uh, hit R, R as in um, rail or rabbit, <laughs> if or Romeo, um, if I tap R to rotate, or R to rotate even, um, if I'm just moving it around, it will freely move. And you can see in the bottom left, it has uh, the angle being listed out. So right now I'm at 56.21 degrees. If I hold Control, as I'm rotating, it will snap to five degree increments, which is a lot more useful for doing exact um, rotation. So I want to snap this 90 degrees. So then the, um, the cross section of this hexagon is now going to be in line with the cross section of our, our pencil reference image. So I'm going to do S for scale, S is in snake, S is in scale, scale down, and holding control again, I can snap by 10% um, scaling increments. So I'm going to go down to um, 0.1, so it's now 10% as small, and roughly aligns with the uh, kind of the width of the pencil in our reference image here. So now we have the hexagon kind of in the middle of the pencil, and what we want to do now is um, either extrude in both directions or extrude in one direction to get our entire pencil. So in this case, what I want to do is I'm going to select our reference image for the pencil, and I'm just going to drag this back and kind of center it roughly at like the front of the, uh, where, uh, at the origin. So then when we go back to our pencil, it's kind of at the front. So in this case, then I will only be extruding backwards in one direction instead of like having to move this and extrude in two directions or anything along those lines. Um, obviously, I didn't have to move my reference image. I could have moved my, my vertices for my hexagon or just extruded in two directions or done things like that. But um, in this case, I kind of like to think of because your hand, when you're, you're holding a pen and writing with a pen, you're usually grabbing, you know, down near the tip. That's kind of like the center of rotation. Um, so that's kind of where I want my origin to remain and just sort of model around there. That's kind of my thought process for moving the, the, uh, the reference image, the pencil back. So I'm going to do E for extrude. E is an egg or eagle um, or extrude. And that will let me start to, uh, it will create new vertices and start extruding, um, creating new edges, creating new faces. Um, and in this case, I can hold control, snap, and start pulling just along the x-axis here. Click, and I can, um, to keep moving again, instead of extruding and adding new faces, I'll just grab, do G as in um, giraffe, or G for grab. Grab those edges again, hit tap X to constrain them, lock them so they're only on the X-axis, and then hold control to keep snapping to the grid, and just move up to the end of the pencil there. Um, just to the uh, like edge of where the, uh, the pencil, the um, eraser cap is. Um, maybe even just go grab and just move it one step further because usually like the cap is pinched over the uh, pinched over the wood of the pencil as well as pinched over the rubber of the um, the eraser so they're kind of both inserted into each other so let's just move it a little bit further into the into the metal um, and like I said I want this image to in the depth let's move it on front and let's just uh, use alpha and change our opacity down a little bit so it's always on top and I can kind of see through it. That's what I want. 0.28, maybe, maybe 0.25. So then I can constantly see I've got my hexagonal cylinder and the pencil. Now something I am noticing right now, um, if I hide the pencil, um, there's a sort of weird effect where like I'm seeing the inside of the uh, the hexagonal cylinder here, but not the outside. Um, this has to do, this is an issue called um, 
our normals are inverted, and so our back faces are invisible. I'll explain what that means. So, the normal uh, of a uh, face in a 3D object is um, the direction that the face is pointing perpendicular from it. So if we jump back into edit mode um, and we go down to like the, little, the icon down here that looks like two little spheres and grab the, uh, the drop down arrow next to it, we have a bunch of options for um, things that we can turn on and off in the world. So we could hide the, the floor grid, we could change the scale of the grid and all these sorts of things. Um, that we don't want to mess around with right now. But what I want to turn on just just for um, demonstrative purposes is down here under normals, I want to actually show display the normals for my faces. And you can see that now suddenly I get these like blue cross grid in the middle of, of the faces here, and they're all pointing inwards. Um, it'll be a little bit easier to demonstrate if I go ahead and change their size like 0.01 um, so they're not intersecting. And you can see that all these faces, if I go inside, you can see the faces. If I go outside, you can see that from the back, they become invisible, and you can kind of see through them. So all the faces, their normals are pointing inside of the object instead of outside of the object. Um, and this is a common issue that can happen if you're extruding in one direction or the other. Blender will kind of try to um, like automatically determine what's the inside of the object, what's the outside of the object, depending on what you've done, um, which direction you've pulled the faces. Um, and in our uh, viewport settings here, we can see that um, by default we have this option for back face culling. If I turn that off, everything becomes solid. If I turn it on, the faces, um, because they're pointed inwards, not outwards, we're looking at them from the back, they are being turned invisible from the back. Um, and it's useful, I find it's useful, you need to keep back face culling enabled, especially if you're working with models that are going to be sent to a video game engine, because back face culling is an optimization that video game engines use to uh, avoid rendering objects in situations where they don't have to. So if you're seeing something from the rear um, or from the inside out, back face culling is enabled, you can see through it. Um, so having it turned on in Blender lets you know um, when you've accidentally got your normals inverted, um, and in a game engine your, your model would look incorrect and render incorrectly. Um, so the, the fix to this is really easy. We go into edit mode, we make sure that we tap A to select all, and we hit shift N as in number, um, shift N as in normal, and it will recalculate our normals. And we can toggle, is it going to be inside, is it going to be outside, um, and just tell it to recalculate what's inside, what's outside, make sure that our faces are pointing, our normals are pointing outwardly. Um, so things are invisible from the inside, but you're not going to be, you're never going to be seeing the inside of the pencil like this. You're only going to be see the, seeing the pencil from the outside. So this is what we want to be solid. Um, so that little bit of a quirk um, that you might not be aware of uh, gives us a little bit of a learning opportunity. So cool, we can turn back on our reference image. Now that we know that our pencil is solid and the normals are facing outwardly, we can continue modeling. Uh, so the next thing I'm going to do is jump back into edit mode. I'm going to hold alt and select um, the ring at the front. So alt will select loops of vertices. Um, so I'll select the whole ring at the front here. Go to our side view, extrude, tap X to constrain it to the x-axis, and hold control to just go forward to like the end of the pencil lead there, and click to stop. Then I'm going to do S to scale, and scale this in to like 0.2, and we're starting to get like the front of the pencil there. And to transition between the two of these things, I'm going to Eventually, I will like subdivide and smooth off this to make it more rounded. So we'll get like the hexagonal cross section from this side, and it'll turn into a it'll smoothly transition to a cylinder over here. But we'll we'll deal with that momentarily. Um, but now we'll do one more time. I'll extrude again, constrain to the x-axis, and bring it forward um, to the end of the pencil lead. And th then this like these loops of faces will become the pencil lead. Um, now that we've fixed our normals, I'll go ahead and turn off. I'll just click and turn off our normals again, just so we're not seeing the blue lines that are really distracting all the time. Um, and what I'm going to do, I could try to scale in these faces, or these uh, vertices, into the middle and like 
scale them to zero, so they all pinch to, to one point. However, that would be, you'd have overlapping vertices there, and it would be, they wouldn't actually be connected. Um, these faces wouldn't be connected at that point. So instead of trying to scale them all into each other and then have like eight overlapping vertices there, what we can do instead is merge all of these vertices into one vertice in the middle, and then the, uh, the tip of the pencil here will become like a triangle fan of connected faces. So what I'll do to merge, um, I can either tap W, which will pull up um, the special contextual menu with all of our, um, with a bunch of options for um, edit mode operations, including our loop tools and subdividing, extruding and stuff. And we have merge down here, or the short shortcut for merging, which you can see kind of in faded gray next to the command there is Alt M. So I'll do Alt M and I wanna merge at center. So we'll merge all of those eight vertices into one vertice at the center and turn it into a nice mathematically perfect sharp pinpoint at the center there, which is exactly what we want for like a really, really sharp, pointy, well, well sharpened pencil. So going back to our front view, the next thing we will do is we will go ahead, um, and let's let's add our metal um, pencil uh, cap here as its own separate object because I want to demonstrate a way to use a modifier to do this. So I'll go back to object mode, just tabbing, uh, moving over back to object mode, Shift A to add a new mesh, and I will add a new. Uh, let's add a new cylinder to the scene. Let's make it a cylinder. Um, and like I said, it's so easy to accidentally mis misclick. Uh, I move my, my cursor, so let's go ahead and delete that. Shift C to reset our cursor back to the origin, and now let's add our cylinder. Um, this cylinder, we can make it like 16 vertices instead of 32. Um, let's change the radius down to uh, like 0.1, I believe is how thick our pencil was, and let's make the depth like 0.2. Um, and for our capping, instead of n-gons, I'm going to set it to nothing, so it's a hollow a cylinder with no top or bottom. Um, and then we are good to, let's rotate this by 90 degrees. I'm just holding control to snap it. Grab X to so we'll hold it on the X axis and move it over here. And then in edit mode, I can select this ring, grab on the X axis and just move it up to like the end of, of where the uh, the reference image there is. And so now, if I hide my reference image, we can see that we kind of have the pencil cap here. It's perfectly round. It's kind of clipping through the pencil, but that's not a huge deal. Um, but there's a couple problems. One thing is, um, it's not smooth. So you can see the individual faces. It's very faceted here. That's a little bit of an issue. Um, so what we want to do is, what we're doing right now is we're using the flat shading mode, which lets us see each individual face as if it's a flat face. But we want to smooth this out so we can switch it to smooth shading, and then it will sort of blend between these faces and treat them as if it's a smooth circular transition. Um, so we can either go to Object, and then switch between Shade Flat and Shade Smooth here. Or again, that special W menu, I can go Shade fl Flat, Shade Smooth here. So I'll go to Shade Smooth. And that'll work fine. And I'll show a way that it breaks momentarily, but we're going to go to the next step. And the next step is I'm going to add a modifier to this cylinder to give it some thickness. So it has some, so it's not just like perfectly, like infinitesimally thin and one sided. It actually has some like thickness to it. Um, and so what I could do, I will go ahead, let's, well, I'm going to duplicate this cylinder just for, for demonstrative purposes. What I could do is in, in edit mode, select all my faces, extrude, scale them out, and just manually add thickness like that. Um, however, on, on a pencil eraser, you know that they, they, they're kind of, um, they're pressed metal, they're kind of bumpy and wavy, they got some texture to them. So what if we wanted to, to change this up, add some flaring to this, or what if this was, wasn't was the cap on a pencil eraser, what if this was a, a pot or, or a, a ceramic dish or a mug or, or something like that. Um, if I wanted to have this be, uh, have even thickness, but then change the profile of it, um, 
if I wanted to add a loop, uh, loop cut here, so Control R to add a loop cut, and then scale this outwards, you know, I'm, I'm flaring it from the outside, but the inside is still the perfect cylinder with the perfectly flat faces, and maybe we want that. But what if we want this to be perfectly even thickness all the way around? Okay, so I gotta add a loop cut to the outside, add a loop cut to the inside, make sure I'm always selecting both of them, scaling them at the same time, just to try to keep the even thickness. Um, and then if I ever do something like I'm trying to like round off and bevel the outside, oops, I forgot to select the inside, so the inside's not, it becomes very complicated to make sure and manage that you're selecting the inside and the outside always at the same time, perfectly evenly, and to keep the thickness even. So what we can do instead is use a thickness modifier, only use a one-sided face, and then just dynamically add the thickness afterwards. So we're always working with just one set of vertices and then adding the thickness afterwards as, as like a filter. Um, and then it, we know for sure that we're always using even thickness and then not having to worry about accidentally selecting or not selecting the inside or the outside of the object. So in object mode, I'm going to go to this little wrench icon. This little wrench icon is our modifiers. And in our modifiers, I want to add, it's called solidify to add thickness to the model. So I will solidify it. And you can see instantly that I have this little thickness slider I can push in and out. And so let's solidify it inwardly by like 0.01. And then if I jump into edit mode and make it thicker, make the uh, cylinder a little wider, you can see the thickness is still pressing into the pencil and our cylinder is now outside and it's it's clipping through, but it's fine because like pressed metal, it would kind of act as if it was clipping through, pinching into the model anyway. You, you don't need to worry about that too much. So in this case, maybe 0.02 is a better thickness. Um, we'll just add thickness until it kind of goes through the pencil. Um, just so it, you don't see a little bit, well, maybe not, maybe 0 0.02, 0 0.015, so there's a little bit of a gap, so you can kind of see through it, give it some depth to the pencil, but um, the thing I, I want to focus on right now that, that is kind of obviously giving us problems is we switch to the smooth, uh, smooth shading mode, but obviously the top and bottom of our um, pencil cap here should be flat, because it's like cut flat, it's, it's not rounded, it's not... Um, pillowed, these edges should be flat, but the lighting is treating it as if it's not flat, it's as if it's rounded. Um, and so let's go ahead and fix that. The, the way to fix that is we want to automatically decide whether or not our normals should be treating it as a smooth shading or, or a flat shading. And so in our object properties, I'm sorry, in our uh, object data properties, which is this little triangular, green triangular icon, under normals, you can actually toggle auto smooth and set an angle threshold where it will like set that that edge is sharp and it should use flat shading um, to break the smooth transition between those two edges. So if I set it really, really low to like 15 degrees, because we're using a 16 sided um, cylinder, 15 degrees is too shallow, it's treating all the, the the edges as if they should be split, as if they shouldn't be smooth shading. Eh, that's not good, because we're basically just using flat shading again. But if we turn that threshold back up to like over 20, 25 degrees, um, by default it's 30, that works perfectly. In some circumstances you might want to tweak this up, maybe 60 degrees, and then it splits, maybe 45 degrees, and then it splits. It'll depend on your model. But in this case, uh, 30 degrees seems to be working pretty much perfectly for what we needed to do. So we'll leave it there. That fixes our lighting errors. Cool. So let's keep going with what we were doing. We've got our pencil here. We got the cap. Let's turn on our, our um, uh, background image again, our reference image again, and let's go ahead and we'll do one more cylinder and just add in the little pencil eraser. So we'll go ahead, make sure our cursor is at the origin, add in a new cylinder, we'll rotate that. We can even type in 90 to do 90 degrees instead of having to like rotate it with the mouse. Grab it on the X, move it over, keep it snapped. In this case, in edit mode, I will scale it down just a little bit because the pencil, uh, the eraser looks a little bit thinner. 
And then I'll select my top ring, extrude, scale it in, and then extrude one more time and merge at center. And so the reason I'm doing that is we can we can see in our reference image that the uh, the end of the pencil here is a little bit rounded, or the eraser is a little bit rounded, but we'll go ahead and, and do that rounding using um, modifiers, just so we can dynamically change that as needed. So let me hide the reference image for now. Let me set this to smooth shading and use our auto, auto normals like we did before. And let's play around with some of our modifiers. So to add a little bit of rounding on the edge, um, we could use two different modifiers. We could either use our subdivision modifier, which will is a kind of combination of adding edges. So if I go to my wireframe view, as I turn this up, it adds edges. Um, it adds edges to our model. So it makes it higher density. If we look down in our information, we can see that faces are like 3,000. If I do another layer, we're now at like 22,000 because it's always like doubling the uh, the number of edges. Um, but it's also performing a smoothing operation at the same time. So that actually looks pretty good for like what we want for a pencil shape, um, for a pencil eraser shape. But it's also really inefficient because we can see that now we're up to 22,000 um, uh, triangles just to get a pencil eraser shape. Um, the alternative to this is that instead of just doing a, um, a subdivision, which is doubling the vertices every time, every level, and smoothing everything, we could use the bevel modifier and use some of these um, limiting methods to only do the bevel on the edge. So let's limit it by angle, so we're not beveling every edge. And just like our, um, our automatic normals was uh, only applying... You know, it was breaking the, the sharp edge at anything over 30 degrees. In this case, the bevel is only going to be applied to anything over 30 degrees. So the focus of the bevel is just on what was previously, you know, this harsh 90 degree angle here and not on the smooth edges of our cylinder. So bevel, limit by angle. Um, I can make the thickness of this, the offset of this, bigger or smaller, so let's make it smaller, and then just turn up the number of segments so it's a smoother transition. So now it's like eight segments, so if we were to go to wireframe view, we can see this is eight sides. If we turn down the number of segments to, like, you know, three, we've got three segments. Turn it up to like six, we've got six segments. Go back to solid view, and you know what? Six segments, looking pretty decent there. Um, and if we wanted to, like if we look at it from the front, we go, ah, the uh, the sixteen sided cylinder is is not smooth enough. It's it's too stair steppy. I want this to be even smoother. We can actually add a subdivision modifier after the bevel and not have to use so many levels of it. So we could go ahead and do our subdivision and just do like one or two levels of it. And now see, we're only at four thousand instead of twenty two thousand triangles. But the final effect is a lot smoother and cleaner than if we were just trying to use the subdivision modifier. Um, so let's go ahead and use the subdivision modifier on the uh, the pencil cap here as well, a little crimped cap. So what if we were to use the subdivision modifier here? Ah, a little bit of a problem. Um, the subdivision modifier, because it's smoothing, it's smoothing everything evenly. Um, we get kind of a, a napkin ring effect because suddenly, like the what used to be um, flat, sharp edges on the cylinder here are now kind of being smoothed off and rounded into like this ovular, um, elliptical shape because it's trying to smooth everything. We want to keep those sharp edges. So what we can do in this case um, is go ahead and add a crease, and we want a crease on the edges. So on our inner and our outer edges, adding a crease to just pinch those edges and make sure that even if we um, add a bunch of subdivision smoothing afterwards, those edges remain creased and pinched. So that's perfect. So now from this side, you know, as we toggle on and off our subdivision modifier, we can see, um, or even as we jump into edit mode, our underlying model is really low poly, easy to work with. And then our subdivision modifier is dynamically 
up resing the uh, geometry to a higher resolution and smoothing it out to an acceptable level for us. Um, and obviously, if this were a pencil in a video game, you know, even 12,000 triangles for that pencil in a video game would be far, far, far too many. Um, we would really want to optimize it, but for like a close-up in a VFX shot or just for the demonstration of this modeling tutorial, we're not worrying about optimization too much in terms of reducing our number of faces. Um, I wanted to show here how to use the bevel modifier because it's a really powerful, useful modifier, but we're not worrying too much about like our number of edges and faces. Um, so let's go ahead and let's do the same thing um, here. Let's smooth this out because we can smooth out the front of the pencil to be round and then sharpen up our edges to keep our like um, hexagonal pencil shape here um, by using creases. Just like we were using creases here, we're going to use creases here. So I will add my subdivision modifier, turn it up a couple levels, and you can see that everything gets smoothed out evenly. But we want to keep, in edit mode, we want to keep our hexagonal cross section. Um, so what we can do is actually, if we select by hand, I'm holding shift and selecting these edges, or I can do a ring select, but holding shift, or, uh, um, sorry, holding control, a ring select that selects, um, instead of a ring, uh, if I, normally if I select a ring, it will select a ring like that, um, of all the edges um, that are kind of tip to butt, tip to tip to tip, point to point to point. But in this case, what I want to do is I'm selecting a ring of edges that are all um, like parallel to each other, connect um, with connected faces. So it's like each of the faces are, uh, the edges are facing this way to each other, but they're interconnected with faces touching each other. So if I hold Alt and Control, you can select um, parallel rings of edges instead of just interconnected rings of edges, um, which is super useful. So I'll go ahead, I'll select those, or I could have selected them manually, and I will turn up the crease just for those edges. So underneath my, up here, the top one, item, I can either turn up the mean crease by turning up this, uh, this slider, and you can see that it starts to like sharpen up the edges of our, um, you can see it sharpening and like pinching the edges of our cylinder outwards. Um, the other thing I'm going to do really quickly is turn on our smooth, smooth shading mode, turn on our auto smooth just so it, we don't get like the stair steppy effect. So going back to edit mode, I can either turn up the mean crease this way and you can see that it sharpens up the, uh, the edges of our pencil. Or the, uh, the shortcut for doing mean crease is shift E as an egg, and then I can drag my mouse to turn up. So I'll drag my mouse all the way up, turn up the creasing. Um, but then the other issue is that the pencil starts to like smooth front to back as well as around the, um, the diameter of the pencil. So it's smoothing. It's, uh, it's not just smoothing in this direction. It's also smoothing in this direction. It's smoothing in all directions at the same time. Um, so we actually want to also select the ring of vertices here and add a mean crease here and just pull the, uh, the transition forward, pinch, pinch the transition forward here. And we can do like an intermediate. Maybe we want to do, you know, all the way or we could turn it down a little bit. In this case, I'll just turn it up all the way. And so we get that kind of, um, that like pencil sharpener effect where we're getting kind of an arc where we go from the body of the pencil into like the, the pencil sharpeners rounded it off. So that kind of works for us. Um, it's not super pretty. It's not what I do ideally, but for like a beginner's guy, this works perfectly well for modeling a pencil. So that's pretty much all the modeling done for now. That's all we really needed. Um, but why don't we just make this look pretty? Let's, let's actually make this look like um, a pencil. Let's add some materials to this. So this little uh, sphere uh, or circle with like a, a grid pattern applied to it, that little button, that icon, this is our material panel. So we can start adding materials to our object. Um, 
So in our viewport shading modes, we want to switch over to our viewport shading, our uh, material preview shading. So when we start adding materials, we can actually preview what they'll look like, not just like a flat the flat shading mode you get in um, in our solid shading. We want material preview, so we see what our final material will look like. So we'll start with um, the easiest one is going to be the steel of the pencil ring here. So I'll go ahead, add a new material. I'll call this like steel. And I will change some of our sliders. So we covered in our last session um, PBR shading, physically based rendering shading. And what like all of these sliders do, it seems a little bit overwhelming, but it's actually it's a simple way developed by um, Disney's Pixar division for using um, just a handful of sliders to make really complicated materials that are that are um, they have the properties of the material interact with light um, in a way that's based on the physics of how photons actually interact with the real surfaces in the real world. But it's an artistic approach to it that makes it a lot easier for artists to just with a handful of sliders change the properties of a material so that they look realistic. Um, so, so for a steel, a steel obviously would be kind of a, uh, a gray color. So we'll start with our base color being kind of a gray color. And then obviously it's a metal and metal interacts with light a little bit differently. So we'll turn this all the way up and say it's yes, it's totally 100%. It's a metal. Um, and you can see how that kind of affects the, the sheen of our object. Um, and then under our roughness, let's, uh, let's make it a little bit shinier. Let's not make it so rough. Let's make it a little bit more mirror-like. So we'll drag the roughness slider, roughness slider down a little bit and make our reflections just that little bit sharper. And so now we have steel there. And maybe, maybe that gray is even too light, uh, too dark. Like, like, make it brighter. Like, if we look at our reference photo, the, the reference metal there is really bright. So let's make it bright. There we go. Bright and shiny. And so we can select the, uh, let's go ahead and select the eraser, add a new material for it. Let's call it eraser. Let's make the base color for that eraser pink to be like a, a pink eraser. So that works pretty well. Um, it's obviously not metallic. It's not an anodized eraser. It's non-metallic. Um, the, the technical term for that is a dielectric material. Um, and the roughness here, we can play around with it. We can make it like super, super shiny, but um, erasers are usually not that shiny, so we can play around with it. Maybe it's like um, 0.6 roughness. That's kind of like, that looks realistic to me. Um, and so for the pencil body here, we have a slight issue in that, like, obviously the the pencil itself, the outside is going to have that, like, yellow coating. But then the wood underneath is going to be shaved and, and be like that beigey wood color. And then the, the lead, the pencil lead, we'd expect to be, you know, a, a dark uh, carbon charcoal-y black color. Um, but it's all one model. And what we've been doing is one material per model. Um, that creates a problem, right? Well, no, you can actually drag this down and add multiple materials to each model. So let's go ahead and just add multiple materials to this one model, or just break up the surfaces into separate materials. So we'll start off with um, the, uh, the yellow pencil color. Uh, we'll set the base color to like a orangey yellow, like a school bus yellow kind of color. Um, it's not metallic, but maybe it's a little bit shinier. So let's do like maybe 0.4 is like shiny enough for the pencil body. Um, and then we'll add a new material, just using the plus sign here, add a new material, new, and we'll do, we'll call this wood, and we'll do like the pencil shaving bit, um, and we'll assign this just to the front. So we'll go back into edit mode, select our faces here, and we want this to be wood. When we're in edit mode, you'll see that this little, uh, little contextual buttons pop up here, where we have select, assign, and deselect, so we'll assign wood to the faces that we just selected there. Cool. We'll make the wood a slightly um, like manila brownish gray kind of color, make it a little bit more rough. Obviously, again, it's not a metallic thing. We don't need metalness, so that's fine. Um, and then we'll do the same thing we just did and then select the tip of the pencil, the pencil lead, and make a pencil lead. So let's add a new material, slot, add a new material, we'll call this lead. Um, Let's spell it correctly so it's not like lead zeppelin, but it's actually like pencil lead. We'll make this like a really dark, charcoal-y, blackish kind of color. Jump into edit mode, select our faces here. Um, 
Uh, and this points out a, a unique issue. So I'm trying to hold Alt and select the ring. So for back here, we selected. I held Alt and selected the ring of faces that are connected to each other um, to select everything for the, that uh, we want to be the shaped pencil wood. But at the front, it's not letting me select a ring of faces. Um, the reason for that is that we merged all of these vertices to one point at the center. So actually, if we look at it from a front view, this is actually a fan of triangles, whereas here we have a ring of um, squares, of rectangles. So let me, let me go ahead. I'm going to add a circle to our scene. Let's turn up the number of, of vertices here to like 32. And I'll just drag this over just for demonstrative purposes, and I'll jump into edit mode. If I extrude and scale in, extrude and scale in, extrude, and then merge at center, essentially this is what this is the shape of our pencil. So this is like this ring is our pencil body, this ring is like our shaved um, pencil wood here at the front, and then this fan is the lead, the tip of the lead, that we all merged into one singular point at the center here. And you can see, I can select a ring here, I can select a ring here, I can't select a ring for the fan at the center. Um, and the reason is that selecting a ring in Blender, what you're doing is it, it uses the flow of the edges um, one into the other to determine how a ring of faces actually connects to each other. So in the case of um, uh, quads, four-sided faces here, you can see that we have, um, I'll go ahead, add myself a new, new little note pencil, we have edge, 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 edge. We have four edges making up this quad face. And when it comes to squares, or rectangles in algebra or in geometry, um, you always have two edges that are parallel to each other or that are, are across from each other. So there's always these two edges and these two edges are connected by two edges. These are parallel, these are parallel. So obviously one and two are parallel, three and four are parallel. And so if I were to, to, to determine like the directionality, um, which is a weird term for it, but the direction of, of a loop of faces. Um, what I'm doing is kind of connecting parallel to parallel. So if I were to select a loop, I'm going from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, using these sort of um, parallel edges as like the direction of the loop flowing across the surface. So the surface will flow with a direction here, and it will flow with a direction here. So I can select um, faces in a loop ring this way and a loop ring this way, but when you hit a triangle, you run into an issue. And the issue with a triangle is um, you don't have you don't have that directionality. This edge is not parallel to this edge. These aren't really connected. You can't determine a flow. This edge and this edge aren't really parallel, and if they are, they're parallel in the same way that these two edges are parallel. So determining like a direction of flow, you can't do. With a square, this side and this side are parallel. The flow goes this way. This side, this side, the flow goes this way. With a triangle, the flow could go anywhere. The geometry is kind of pinched at a triangle, so you can't select a ring in that way. Um, so in this case, instead of holding Alt to select our pencil lead, sorry, that was like an overly uh, lengthy explanation of this issue, but um, because all of these are pinched into a, into a, a single point, these are all, um, it's called a pole um, in our geometry flow. And so what we have to do is either select manually by hand each of these faces individually, or if we go to a side view and turn on our wireframe, we can just box select B, as in beagle or bagel, um, box select them, and just select all of those points. And like we did with um, the wood and everything else, we'll go to lead, assign it the lead material, and if we go back to our material previews, we now have all lead material, and we can make that as shiny or not shiny as we want it to. 
um, 0.5 actually looked pretty, pretty realistic to me. Um, so there we go. That's kind of a, a basic introduction to um, sort of the, the, the fundamentals of 3D modeling. Extruding, grabbing, moving, rotating, um, and assigning basic materials to objects in Blender. Obviously we could, um, like we did in the last um, intermediate session, we could UV unwrap this and add like uh, actual wood grain texture to this and like add um, text on the side of the pencil or we could um, add all kinds of fancy knurling textures to this or like pencil shaving textures to the to the eraser um, but right now we're but for this class we're just doing like a basic introduction to the fundamentals of modeling and the fundamentals of applying materials to objects in blender so um, at this point we'll switch into questions and concerns but we'll cut off the recording for our archive at this point so um thanks for tuning in everybody